Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the AAAS meeting. My name is Jim Elser. I'm the director of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. It's great to have everyone here online. I'm speaking to you from Arizona, where it's sunny and 75 degrees. And so uh, perhaps you, uh, it's a real shame that you're not here, but uh, in person, but it's good to be able to run this meeting virtually in any regard. So welcome to the session called Phosphorus and Climate Change, a Vicious Circle. I'm here with uh, Matt Schultz, who's the program manager of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, and he's going to be our discussant today. And we're here also live with our speakers from our session. Uh, John Downing is director of the Minnesota Sea Grant Program at NOAA and the University of Minnesota in Duluth. Good morning, John. Morning, Jim. <laughs> Sorry, got, got you there with your mute. And we're also here with uh, Laura Johnson, who's a professor at Heidelberg University. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. And we're here with Aaron Britton, who's the Chief Technological Officer of Astara Nutrient Recovery Technologies Corporation. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. All right. Well, it's great to have everyone here and to have folks joining us from uh, who are attending AAAS meeting. We have a very exciting topic today uh, about the interactions between phosphorus and climate change and these connections, uh, these um, uh, interactions occur because the biogeochemical cycles are connected. We know that climate change is driven largely by changes in the carbon cycle, but because these cycles are largely biological, they're, collected, they're connected to other chemical elements that are important for life. And one of the most important chemical elements for life is, of course, phosphorus. So we're making the connections today uh, between phosphorus-driven eutrophication of inland waters of lakes, rivers, and coastal oceans as well, um, how the eutrophication process changes the emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, special me especially methane. This in turn, of course, may contribute to changes in climate, changes in temperature, that is, and changes in uh, precipitation regimes which then, of course, feed back on the whole system by altering the dynamics of phosphorus loading that, um, uh, that uh, lakes and, and rivers and oceans receive. We're talking about those connections. We're also going to be talking about the solutions that we might bring to bear on them, um, to some innovations that are coming online that are going to be able to uh, get us into a better position for a sustainable phosphorus system. And so um, we're going to just get rolling here. I'm going to ask each of the speakers to sort of give a little recap of the talk. I'm presuming everyone um, already has listened to the excellent presentations we heard, but we can have a little recap of the major findings from each of the uh, speakers. And then we're going to launch into some questions. And if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box, I believe. Is that right, Matt? So put them in the chat box as you may have brought them from watching the videos earlier or as they come up to, uh, during the session. And so let's get going. John, you want to fill us in on and give us a little recap of uh, the work, the important work that you um, talked about and big price tag attached. Give, give us a summary. Oh, happy, happy to do so, Jim. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I took a kind of a wide view of this, sort of the widescreen um, limnology and ecology of methane flux, uh, or actually greenhouse gas flux to the atmosphere, and its uh, potential impact not only on climate, but um, on uh, the social cost, to uh, the cost to people into the future. And, um, and actually, uh, my little presentation was really closely aligned with Aaron's and, and Laura's that we have close connections amongst us. But what we did was with this widescreen approach to um, ecology was to collect all the data in the world we could find on emissions of greenhouse gases from inland waters, uh, did some empirical modeling to um, determine what are the biggest variables driving those emission rates. And um, then we did two things with that, then um, calculated the atmospheric impact of those diverse greenhouse gases and then monetize that and turn that into some numbers um, indicating what it would cost the people of the planet. And um, over the next uh, little while, one really important thing uh, as Jim suggested in his introduction is methane's the big gas that's driven by phosphorus. Well, actually the first thing is phosphorus is a huge driver of um, of greenhouse gas emission to the atmosphere. So as we ramp up 
the, that phosphorus, we're going to ramp up those rates of emission and then the impact on the atmosphere. Um, it, and um, but methane's the big one. It's about 75% of the atmospheric impact coming from inland waters, and um, and it's a very huge impact in terms of um, being close to something like a quarter of the uh, impact of all um, petroleum burning on the planet right now uh, with an um, a, a, a ability to increase in impact from uh, one and a half to three times by 2050 and it's in its impact on the atmosphere, which is really huge. And then once we uh, looked at the present value of what we will need to pay to mitigate socially that atmospheric impact. It runs, the estimates run from about six to um, about 80 million, actually. Uh, we had refined the numbers uh, since we uh, did the recording. So it's 80, sorry, six to 80 trillion. Let me get a T on the front of that. It's a really, really big number. And that's, uh, that's impact on things like people's health, um, their uh, cities, their coastal infrastructure, and so on into the future up to about 2050. Of course, it'd be much larger running out to tw um, 2100. John, um, is that cumulative uh, cost or is that the... Yeah, th this is a, yeah, it's a thing called present value. So this is basically what you'd, the money you'd have to come up with today to uh, financially mitigate the, um, that impact by 2050. So um, it's a, uh, and this is, it all depends. The estimates depend on what you're assuming is going to be the interest rates or discount rates and so on, and how fast the greenhouse gas emissions will increase and how much phosphorus will increase in the water. Because if it increases faster, we'll get more emissions and more atmospheric impact and so on. Yes, it's, it's cumulative in that we um, calculated it up to 2050, right? Okay, fantastic. Um... Thanks for that nice summary. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Laura Johnson. Laura is taking it from the other perspective. Given climate change going on, how is that those changes going to impact upon the phosphorus loading that uh, drives that gets into lakes and then in turn drives uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Laura, you want to give us a little summary of of your important Lake Erie work? Yeah, happy to. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so in my pre uh, my presentation, just a quick summary is that, you know, I was really trying to delve into some of the causes and um, long term trends that are leading to harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie. Um, one of the things that we know about Lake Erie right now is that what some of the largest inputs into the lake from the Maumee River um, of phosphorus specifically are very closely linked to bloom size and severity. Um, in my presentation, I then also went through other forms of nutrients, particulate phosphorus, uh, suspended sediment, nitrate, and basically showed that our historical trends and patterns in those don't link up quite as well with bloom size and severity. Um, but what's intriguing about these relationships is that the, um, the loading that we have, it's not annual loading that's really important. It's really March through July that's of uh, phosphorus loading that's driving these bloom sizes. When we look at this, we've seen this increase in loads that have happened over, say, the 20, last 20 years or so. The question is, well, how much is that from changes and and potential changes in climate changes that we've already been experiencing in terms of increased precipitation intensity and amounts in the spring? And we were able to do um, with a previous study some back of the envelope calculations to show that up to at least 35% of the increased loading is associated with that, but on fact, a lot of our other increases are also associated with changes in agricultural practices, potentially unintended consequences of moving to reducing soil erosion and, and having more no-till in the, in the watershed. Um, when we look at watershed models, we're trying to link together these big global climate change models with watershed scale models to, to try and forecast what we might see in mid-century in terms of uh, loading and bloom size. What these models are kind of giving us divergent results, and it seems to be because of two different factors or balancing the potential effects of increased precipitation intensity and amounts with the potential increases in evapotranspiration, which in this region are probably going to have the largest impacts at night even, you know, increased nighttime temperatures. And one study, it basically showed that the increases in precipitation were enough that it's going to increase loading and lead to more severe blooms. But on the flip side, another study by Margaret Kalsik's group from Ohio State showed that 
um, it, that there's enough evapotranspiration that in fact loads might go down by mid-century because there'd just be less loading. Um, and so then that would subsequently imply a fewer blooms. But I, I sort of wrapped my presentation up with uh, a case study. In 2019, we had a really interesting scenario where it was so much precipitation, only half of the Maumee River ended up being planted, uh, Maumee River watershed ended up being planted, and there was a far less application of both phosphorus fertilizers as well as manure. And that led to lower than expected dissolved phosphorus loads that led to a smaller than expected bloom, uh, given the amount of flow that we had in 2019. And so what that points to is the idea that we might not be able to even understand the potential changes that are going to happen in agriculture to affect what we see in the lake. There are a couple of things that I wasn't able to sort of fit into my presentation um, that I wanted to sort of update you guys on now. The first thing was that nitrate loads in 2019 were also very low compared, you know, similar to dissolved phosphorus, really pointing to the idea that it was uh, fertilizer applications that were um, basically being missed. They missed that timing window for the bloom and, and that had an effect on, on the lake. But what was interesting about 2019 is that we had lots of particulates, lots of sediment that still came off of all of our used fields. You know, we still had erosion, we still had high flows. And so that helped us be able to think about, you know, we can help us think about what we need to be doing on the land in order to reduce different types of runoff scenarios, particulates versus soluble nutrients. On top of it, in 2020, I'm sure you're dying to know that what we had found was dissolved phosphorus loads bounced up and were about what we expected. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a huge year, but they were right where they expected, which supports the idea that it was seemed to be something within the year, the form of either timing or placement of fertilizer application that probably had an effect on those loads. Um, what's funny about 2020 was that particulate phosphorus and suspended sediments were actually higher than expected, which might seem weird, but if you think about it, there was a lot of fallow grounds that were unplanted. There was a lot of weed burden. And so a lot of ground working in, at the end of 2019 into 2020, see this big pulse of, of particulates. And we didn't see a response of the bloom to that particulate phosphorus. And so this is starting to add to an increasing wealth of information showing that the form of phosphorus is really important when it comes to bloom size and severity. Dissolved phosphorus is going to be our, a big important focus. On top of that, which I think we might have time to chat about um, in discussion, is that nitrogen seems to be closely linked to bloom toxicity. And so these soluble nutrients, I think, are going to be the things that need some attention in, in the coming years. Great. Uh, thank you, Laura. I'm sure it was a pretty interesting year. Um, at Lake Erie. Well, so that's a good lead into our uh, uh, to turn over to Iron because you know one thing in your talk we saw was that one of these struvite-based fertilizers that you're working with does have a strong impact on dissolved phosphorus losses. So, could you walk us through the summary of your talk connecting fertilizer production, greenhouse gas, uh, carbon footprints, and then how um, your your innovations can help reduce the phosphorus loading itself um, to the out of the system. Yeah, thanks for the uh, the introduction and um, a brief summary of what my presentation was about. Uh, we started with uh, looking at the different routes that uh, that phosphorus recovery uh, has been uh, developed uh, from from wastewaters uh, over the over the years, uh, starting from the, the more uh, traditional uh, routes uh, of uh, either direct wastewater reuse or, or biosolids land application. All the way through to to the more uh, more recent approaches relating to extraction of uh, sort of value added products from from wastewater, as as fertilizers, uh, in, including uh, the most common route currently being struvite recovery, uh, the, the mineral struvite, magnesium ammonium phosphate recovery um, from from wastewater uh, for use as a as a fertilizer product. We then uh, moved on to looking at um, some, some work that, that we did uh, with the EPA, looking at the, uh, the, the, the carbon footprint of, of recovered phosphates versus conventional, uh, con conventional phosphates manufactured from, from mined phosphate rock, uh, specifically looking at energy or embedded energy. Uh, and finding that you can actually recover phosphate with about a tenth of the carbon or the energy footprint uh, as you can uh, manufacture a, a, a fertilizer from, from raw materials. 
Um, so, so that was, you know, one, one interesting route um, for, for a, an impact on, on carbon emissions uh, is that, you, you know, as with many things, you can, you can often recover a material um, lower footprint than, than uh, production from virgin raw materials. Um, the, the other part of it is actually ensuring that that recovered material that then, uh, uh, you know, actually has a similar or, or preferably better impact on crop yields. And that's something we at Astara have been working on uh, quite a bit now is, is understanding how to use the, the recovered uh, struvite uh, material as a fertilizer, how to enhance crop yields, how, how you, you actually use that in the field in terms of agronomic practices. I uh, gave an example with potatoes where, where we can use, uh, use the, the, the recovered material as a blend with conventional products uh, and actually get improved yields uh, out, out of the, uh, in this case, potatoes, but uh, sim similar uh, results with other crops. And then as we delve into that, uh, we're trying to understand better uh, what's going on with, with the, uh, the struvite fertilizer uh, that, that's used um, and we, we did some some trials uh, both with uh, with University of Auburn and and were uh, participants in a, in a in a study in the UK called the Peelink Project, looking at uh, runoff and leaching of of soluble phosphate, orthophosphate uh, from fields fertilized with uh, with Crystal Green uh, our, our our struvite product, um, and found that we, we could get uh, you know very substantial almost complete return to to unfertilized control uh in terms of the, the soluble phosphorus running off from a field fertilized with uh with crystal green um to to the to the point where the the, the charts are almost indistinguishable from from the the unfertilized control um also looked at some blends uh, because the reality is the the optimum agronomy that we find is not using pure struvite. It's using a, a blend of struvite with with a water soluble phosphate, um, but you can get that proportional reduction in in the phosphorus runoff or leaching uh, with with that blend of water soluble and, and phosphate uh, and, uh, and and the slow release uh, crystal green product. Yeah. Um, and then we looked at the sort of the next steps that we're looking at is trying to take this uh, this sort of field scale or, or you know even smaller uh, soil plot data and expanding that out to what would this mean in a in a watershed uh, and we're starting to do some work currently with um, environment climate change Canada University of Guelph University of Waterloo looking at uh, the potential impact on Lake Erie uh, leaching from the from the north side of the of the of the border uh, but would also be very interested to start looking at, at what we can potentially do on the on the south side of the border also. I think it's it's very topical. And to, to be honest, the, the climate impact of the phosphorus runoff was not something that was front of mind for, for us until we started joining this discussion. So it's always interesting to see what happens when you uh, you mash together different... Uh, different uh, this is what we're doing. This is a great, uh, great outcome, I think. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So great convergence of events uh, and uh, findings here and technologies here in this session. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Um, Matt, how are we doing? Do we have um, people out there in the universe who are- we've got, we've got time and we have some questions here that we can go, yeah. go into here. Uh, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Matt Schultz with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance at Arizona State. Um, and uh, let's start with a sort of a group question, actually. Um, so I'll feel free to chime in on this, but um, I'm wondering where you think that uh, we're doing the best job of managing eutrophication and maybe speak a little to what, what those um, tactics are that we're employing. Lori, you wanna take a crack at it first? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, uh, so I then thinking about this question, I was like, I don't really know how to answer this. You know, originally, I think uh, Lake Erie was once the poster child for ecosystem you know, recovery from eutrophication, you know, up until about maybe 2005 when, when the blooms had come back enough that it seemed like it was actually a sustainable return and re-eutrophication of Lake Erie. So, you know, in terms of reductions of things like phosphorus from point sources, I think that there's a lot to be learned from the Lake Erie sites. Um, and, but you could take that and say, well, you know, that's been done also throughout the UK as well, dealing with, you know, reducing phosphorus uh, from wastewater. 
the other example I could come up with, aside from like a random reservoir in Ohio where they did watershed management plans like way, way back when, um, is, you know, there, I've heard of uh, really great examples from like uh, Rich McDowell in New Zealand in terms of thinking about the placement of different operations within a watershed and how to move them so that they're no longer critical source areas going into into rivers and and then a eutrophying coastal ecosystem so i think that there's some some interesting things to be learned from management techniques down in new zealand as well anyone else want to chime in aaron I don't, I don't know if it's fair to say that we 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 as a species uh, we seem to be better at uh, responsive action than uh, anticipative action and the the, the you know you look at the the chesapeake bay you know there's been tons of effort put into to improving water quality there same thing with the great lakes so, but it, it's always it's in it's in response to an observed problem uh, you know once the algae blooms start washing up on people's beaches action takes place uh, but we aren't always good at, at then taking the knowledge that that's going to happen again and, and preemptively changing our behavior in order to to prevent it from occurring. Uh, just my, my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to chime in too. I, you know, tongue in cheek, I would say the best uh, phosphorus management is going on where there are no people. Um, and uh, that tends to be a place where we, you know, not, I mean, it's a joke, really. If there, are, but that's the basis of some of our growth projections is population growth and and agricultural growth to feed those people. So, um, this the the population itself is one of the major drivers of phosphorus release, which makes it really hard to get a handle on it. But a little bit more technically, where we did do a good job with managing phosphorus or a relatively good job was where the phosphorus comes out of a pipe that we can recognize. Um, that is the point source versus the non-point source uh, pollution where we were able to institute regulations to uh, manage sewage um, because it comes out of a pipe. It get, when it's a thousand or million pipes, um, as in Iowa or Ohio or um, even in Saskatchewan or various places, um, then it's a lot harder to do. Now, I would maintain that, in fact, animal agriculture should be considered or could well be considered a point source pollution that could be regulated better. Um, and when, and I, I don't know how much experience Laura has out there with a the manure spreader, but um, I bet quite a lot. And oftentimes that, um, that fecal matter is just spread on fields as a way of getting rid of it, not as a way of actually enhancing crop growth. So better management, I know you didn't ask where could we do it better, but that's what I'm answering is, I think with animal agriculture, uh, we could do a far better job at collection and management because it's all aggregated to start with and then we spread it out. Well, I'll just jump and I'll say that one place to do is right here. We can say a good place we've done it is Flathead Lake in Montana. Again, partially because there's not that many people there. Big watershed, not a lot of people, but the population in the watershed has gone up by a factor of five or more during the last 40 years, but it's been municipal. And because in the early 80s, they got a detergent ban, they got advanced wastewater treatment put in, and most of the sewage is being treated. Um, that lake has maintained its relatively pristine status. But now, as you know, we have this whole diffuse uh, phosphorus problem, which is, of course, the Lake Erie problem. And you're very right, John, to point at um, manure as the, you know the the real issue. And this is a, you know maybe a question for Aaron as well. So you know sort of the frontier for um, nutrient recovery is not human waste because even if we got all of the human waste turned into new, renewed fertilizers, we wouldn't close the phosphorus cycle at all, right? We would only have you know maybe 10% of it. A big chunk of it's going to come when we can either reduce the amount of manure being produced by dietary changes or um, get that manure into a technology that is going to recycle that and turn it into a useful product that can be distributed globally, marketed, et cetera. So, Aaron, you want to speak to those technologies that are out there coming online for animal um, waste? Yeah, and I, th I think, as, as you say, the, the um... 
the, the regulatory framework tends to drive some of this change, right? So to the extent that you can spread your manure on, on a field that, that uh, you know, close to the close to the point of generation, that's going to be the most economic way of doing it. Um, as as we realize the the downstream impacts of that, that becomes less and less uh, acceptable to to the folks that live on the uh, on the on the foreshores of, of the the ultimate receiving waters, um, and also you know it, where it ties in with with the rest of the of, of climate change, the the capture of of methane from from that manure and the generation of, of green energy from it tends to drive centralization into some digester projects, some, uh, some uh, you know, green biogas uh, generation projects where you can start substituting some of the, some of the natural gas usage for, for, uh, for, for green energy. Um, and that centralization drives some scale that, that makes recovery uh, you know, using technologies like ours more, more practical. Um, there, there is certainly a, a need for for scale for for uh, for us to be able to compete with uh, with the, the conventional phosphate industry where where they're they're dealing with centralized mines and 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 supply chains. Um, so I think some of the, those those that confluence of events is starting to drive towards uh, a need and an ability to to recover nutrients also from from manures. And as you say, there's probably an order of magnitude more phosphorus in, in animal manures, uh, at least in, in North America, than there is in, in human waste. Matt, what do you got? Uh, yeah, one? so Aaron, uh, following up on that point, so um, there hasn't really been a lot of interest, doesn't seem, from the phosphates industry in developing a lot of enhanced efficiency fertilizers in the realm of uh, controlling phosphates. Um, and so, um, I'm wondering, you, you guys are sort of on the front lines of dealing with farmers and selling them uh, a, a struvite-based product, Crystal Green. And um, I'm wondering if um, you are seeing any evidence of increased demand by farmers for these, for these types of products. Um, and if that's sort of a signal that these, the larger phosphate industry should be paying attention to, in your opinion. <laughs> it's interesting because it, it's, um... The, the, we're sort of following in the footsteps of enhanced efficiency nitrogen fertilizers. I'd say that the, that that change happened in, in nitrogen probably you know 10, 15 years ago with with some of the the first products uh, more aimed at, at reducing ammonia loss to atmosphere, nitrous oxides, and just you know in, enhancing the the use of the fertilizers. Um, and at the end of the day, it comes down to farm yields, right? If we can show that an enhanced efficiency fertilizer not, not only helps the environment, but also gives you, you know, a higher crop yield, then you're going to get uptake. It's, it's very hard to convince the farmer that, that it's a good idea for him to use a, a, a fertilizer that, that's going to reduce runoff, but cut his crop production by 20%, right? Um, at the end of the day, they're running on pretty thin margins and they, they, need to, they need to keep the family fed. But the flip side of it is, these are folks that, that that live on the land that 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 play in the rivers and, and the lakes as well, and and want to leave a legacy for their children that is you know better than the one that they were left. So, uh, what we've found is is in in general, you know, if you show people how it can be done and, and done cost effectively, they're, 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 they'll embrace it wholeheartedly. And 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 the the story of of, of you know, having recovered material coming from from wastewater in the cities to the farm, and then helping mitigate the runoff from the farm as well, it is something that, that people are, are are very much uh, willing to embrace. And, and once they see a, a crop impact, it, it it becomes a sticky product. We have folks that that are you know that have you know honestly worked with us through some some challenging scale up, and and we we don't make enough of the fertilizer to to change the agronomic landscape of of North America yet or, or Europe, but um, there's certainly some folks that are that are pushing us in that direction, which is great to see. Yeah, great. And you know, you mentioned enhanced efficiency nitrogen fertilizers, and that reminded me of something in Laura's talk. So, Laura, um, you you uh, mentioned briefly the the relationship of nitrogen to the toxicity of of algal blooms, and I'm wondering, can you dive into that a little bit for us, and sort of the how the nitrogen phosphorus interplay works? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, 
in freshwater ecosystems, normally it's all a phosphorus story. And part of the reason for that is because the cyanobacteria that are creating these harmful algal blooms, you know, can, there are forms of them that are equally toxic that can fix nitrogen. So that, you know, they're not necessarily relying on nitrogen, but what's growing in Lake Erie right now is microcystis, which is not a nitrogen fixer. So there's more than enough nitrogen to support these blooms. Um, you know, what we can been able to sort of, well, the mystery, I'll say that right now, is that sometimes these blooms are really, really toxic and sometimes they aren't. And it doesn't have anything to do with bloom size, right? 2015 was this huge bloom year. It was hardly toxic. The year before in 2014, it wasn't, the bloom was just forming when it led to the Toledo drinking water crisis. So there's a lot of research going into, well, what are these toxins made of? Well, it turns out they're really nitrogen rich and it seems like nitrogen is availability is a controlling factor. What's confusing about it is, you know, 80% of the nitrogen that's getting into Lake Erie is as nitrate uh, because, you know, with agricultural runoff, but what these blooms prefer is actually reduced nitrogen, like ammonium and organic forms of nitrogen. And so I think that the, the reason that nitrogen availability is important is far more complicated than just inputs like for phosphorus is. Um, you could then argue, well, why even bother with trying to control phosphorus then? And we have to remember that phosphorus is still the driving factor of bloom size. If we didn't have a bloom, it wouldn't be toxic. So. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so um, switching gears a little bit, John, I had a question for you here, which is um, if you could uh, compare the scale of the inland water greenhouse gas emissions to those of wetlands and is there, you know, you, you've sort of demonstrated that wetlands or the, the inland waters have been um, emitting more than we thought previously and more methane. And is a similar story playing out in wetlands because they are such huge uh, sources of methane? Yeah, there's been some really good work on wetlands, although they're still upscaling to global numbers in a very kind of um, semi old fashioned way taking averages and multiplying it by area and so on, which is maybe not the best. But it's still, um, if you look at the more recent um, estimates of um, the amount of emissions of, of methane in particular from wetlands, it's about co-equal with that that we're showing for lakes, in spite of the massive amount of wetland that there is around the world. Lakes are really, really active in driving methane emissions as they, particularly as they become eutrophic due to phosphorus inputs. So um, um, the current projections for wetland emissions of methane, um, well, are basically based on, on temperature and changes in ex extent of wetlands. Um, and the most hideous predictions for wetlands would have about a doubling of methane emission by um, by 2100. So, and we're looking at a potential five-fold increase in eutrophication as a driver of lake methane emissions. So lakes are really, really super active. Um, wetlands, um, uh, according to what I've been able to read in the more recent literature, are probably less likely to grow as much uh, unless they're driven by eutrophication unless they're, and, and phosphorus input. And there is some evidence from the tropics that um, phosphorus will drive up methane emissions in, in wetland systems too. But um, yeah, right now um, it's like 150 teragrams of methane emission from lakes and about 170 uh, teragrams of methane. I mean, these are not laughable numbers when you consider that a teragram is about 2 billion pounds. Um, these are pretty huge numbers. So um, they're about equal, but probably more growth uh, due to phosphorus emissions in lakes and reservoirs. Yeah, and following up on that, so Laura's asked this question, I wonder what that means for wetlands being restored in agricultural areas uh, as a way to reduce phosphorus exports. Uh, it it's, can be really effective. Um, I may have mentioned that I worked in Iowa for a really long time and their uh, constructed wetlands were a terrific way to um, sequester nutrients. The problem is a clean out um, uh, period, the maintenance period. It runs 
uh, you know, something less than 15 years before you have to really rebuild it. So, but then you might, and, and maybe Aaron would comment on this, you'd have a fairly granular, but very phosphorus rich um, sediment that was probably denitrified. So the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio would be pretty, pretty low but it would also have kind of a, it'd be soil-like. And I don't know if you could take this clean out material and recover phosphorus from that. But the, the problem with the, uh, wetland restoration is they are shallow by definition, they fill in fast, unless you're managing erosion really well, which um, sometimes we are and some most times we aren't, so. It sounds to me more like a, a way to, to take that that accumulation and, and put it back on the field uh, directly, right? So if you can, you're, you're almost taking that erosion and, and capturing it before it gets into a water body and, or, or you know, capturing it in the wetland and, and gives you an opportunity to get it back on the field, maybe reduce some of that soil loss as well. Again, it's the same problem with manure. Again, it's too heavy to drive it very far away from where you dug it up. and. Um, if we have an electric truck, that's good because now we're driving CO2 into the atmosphere by trucking it long distances. So maybe with electric vehicles, we can we can imagine digging up our constructed wetlands and distributing their nutrient rich soils over a broad range. So those things are hard, right? It's hard to start. Yeah, there's one other really huge problem with that. And that is, uh, and Aaron probably knows the chemistry of fertilizers better than I do by far, but um, there are trace elements in fertilizer that are accumulated in those transported sediments that are considered to be toxic materials. So every time I was helping people fix a lake or restore a lake in the agricultural region of the Midwest, um, and we were going to be taking out sediment, we had to get permits for disposal of that sediment because it was essentially considered toxic waste due to the heavy metals in it. Um, so it makes it a whole lot harder to put on a field too, Jim. I agree with the energy cost of transport as this is why a lot of that manure goes directly on fields right next to the farm, whether it needs it or not. But, um, exactly. but toxic, toxic metals is, it gets to be an issue. That's great. Um, so while we're talking about conservation practices, wetlands being one of, one of the ones you can implement, um, you know, there's a real movement towards regenerative agriculture right now. And one of the tenets of that is to reduce the amount of tillage um, and practice conservation, tillage, no tillage. Uh, Laura, in your talk, you mentioned that there's a big issue with that in Lake Erie in terms of um, not tilling and then having tile drained systems. Can you delve into that a little bit for us? Absolutely, yeah, that's one of those topics that needs you know, sometimes a whole 20 minutes to itself to get into. So, but I'll, I'll keep it short, I promise. No, it's so um, in this region, we have heavy enough clay soils that what ends up happening, it's not the, the act of not, you have know, no tilling on itself. It's really the lack of, of mixing soil and then the surface application of phosphorus uh, fertilizers or manure. Um, that essentially what ends up happening is it leads to an accumulation of phosphorus you know, in that top one inch of soil, you know, if if we had nice, well-drained soils that could have water infiltrating through it nicely and slowly, it wouldn't be a big deal. What ends up happening in this region is with the tile drains or subsurface drainage to keep the water table low, so we don't have the great black swamp anymore. Um, and having that, we end up getting these sort of cracks and fissures and earthworm channels and basically preferential flow right over the tile drain. So it rains accumulate, you know, interacts mostly with this really highly concentrated phosphorus on the surface and then just hits a tile drain as, you know, essentially out to Lake Erie fairly quickly. Um, and, you know, in Lake Erie, we were talking a lot about manure. What's interesting in this region is most of the phosphorus input is still just commercial fertilizers, you know, livestock and manure applications, not that widespread, although it has been increasing some. So a lot of these issues don't make sense. If you look at the amount of phosphorus in the soil, it doesn't seem high enough to be giving us the problems that we're having. And so I think that this placement and timing um, could be playing a bigger role in, in Lake Erie specifically. And, and that's where it gets a little nuanced. It's an interesting con uh, issue. And I think it links really well both to John's talk as well as Aaron's talk. And with Aaron's talk, you know, the part is 
well, we're, we're applying very, very soluble phosphorus on the surface. And in 2019, we found that 30% of that phosphorus at, you know, doing, dealing with the application um, led to some runoff. And so I can't help but wonder if we were using less soluble forms of phosphorus fertilizers, what role that would play. That's something that is oftentimes, I say, I would think is overlooked. I've only heard people talk about it a few times. Um, for John's point of view, we're talking about losses relative to application of, you know, maybe 1% um, in a year of phosphorus that's applied. So economically, it's really hard to get farmers to want to reduce their losses by investing in very expensive equipment to get phosphorus off the surface. If that's the case, then I can't help but say, can we take this $6 trillion estimate and apply it to some of our economic issues in Lake Erie to give an economic benefit to these, these reductions? Let's take a $90 trillion estimate. <laughs> yes. yeah. I like that research budget better. Yeah. Uh, so as we're, we're getting close to the end. And so I want to ask um, one more sort of big picture question for the group. And that's um, uh, what do you think we'll need to rethink in light of climate change in terms of the research we need to do and the way we need to manage phosphorus uh, in the future. And John, maybe you can kick that off. Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, one of the things that I, I try to end with a positive, you know, the, the positive is if we manage phosphorus, this incredibly valuable element, we win everywhere. We win um, uh, in terms of farmer expense for application of phosphorus, where phosphorus might be limiting the crop growth. We win because we get better water, better quality water, which by the way, I think is the most strategically important uh, resource on the planet right now is good water. And it will be increasingly important in the future. So we get that locally. We win because we get better recreational resources, which locally have huge value. And around Lake Erie, the values are in the dozens of millions annually for being able to use beaches and have decent sport fishing and keep your water purification plant working without totally choking. Um, and we win globally because of the decreased atmospheric impact. I, I talked too long. We got very little time. I'm sorry, but we I win everywhere, and it and it covers everything. That I mean, it covers Aaron and Laura's work as well. We need to rethink uh, phosphorus management in terms of benefits instead of always thinking about the costs. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree totally. That it's important to to mention there is just you know keeping up with the growing population of the planet is going to require yields to remain high um, so that we, we don't have to turn every acre of land in, into cropland, right? Um, so, you know, finding ways of, uh, you know, finding efficient fertilizers that, that put the nutrients into the crop rather than into the soil or into the runoff is going to become increasingly important to, to be able to push more crop out of a, you know, preferably a smaller area of land to feed, to feed more people um, uh, over time. Laura, well, uh, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, you know, I think that John said it really well. I always like to end with a hopeful thing, but, you know, the, the only other thought I would have is, you know, the, what we hear a lot, at least in this region, is we have to come to terms with the idea that we might have to start considering controlling water, which is really hard thing to do is we might be getting more and more water, but thinking about maybe it's not just phosphorus, but you know, there's other ends of the spectrum that um, might help us, and especially thinking of downstream erosional sources of phosphorus, like in stream and stream banks and that sort of thing, that can sometimes be pretty substantial. I think, you know, practices don't always have to just be apply less phosphorus. It can also be apply less phosphorus, have a much healthier soil, hold some water back in places where you can. Those are great final thoughts. I want to thank uh, all, all of you for your tremendous contributions. Thanks, Matt, for helping organize this event. Thank everyone out there who has uh, attended today. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you want to follow up on anything. I do want to make a couple of plugs. There's a nice long article about phosphorus today in the Atlantic Monthly online. 
um, which covers many of these same topics uh, that we dealt with today. And I'll make another plug for this uh, book that just came out. If you want to follow up on these topics, there's a new book about phosphorus um, and its role in society and in our future um, that you can get uh, anywhere books are sold online. So with that, I want to thank again everyone who attended today and thank our, our wonderful speakers and look forward to uh, bumping into you on some virtual um, meeting room or something during the week. So um, on behalf of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance or Arizona State University, um, I want to thank everyone and, um, and have some good phosphorus in the future. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You, Thanks Bye, so everyone. Much. Thank you.